Over the past few weeks, we've been talking about this topic, this idea of being made for mission. And today, I want to move past what is my message and what is my mission and talk specifically about who is my mission. There's this wonderful passage in Mark chapter 12. It is reiterated in two other gospels. At least the first half, the, what is told here, Luke's gospel goes into more detail, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell of this first section. And it says, and one of the scribes came, or one of the lawyers came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, that is, whom Jesus was speaking with, he asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And this was Jesus' answer. He said, the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, this is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Will you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your blessing, your strength, your grace. We thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, this morning that we can draw from it. I pray, Lord, that it will inspire us, encourage us, challenge us, and change us. And, Father, we'll thank you for what you accomplish and what you do in that. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen, amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you, Miss Sandra. I appreciate that. So there's the story about an elderly woman who was in a small town in East Texas, and she was having car trouble. She was on the way to the supermarket one morning, and her car stopped and stalled at a stop sign. She tried everything she could do to get the car going again, but with no luck. Suddenly, a man in a pickup truck came up behind her, and he was obviously agitated, and he started honking his horn at her impatiently. She, um, she doubled her efforts on what to do in trying to get the car going again, but had no success. She pumped the gas, she turned the ignition, but still no luck. The man in the pickup truck continued to honk his horn consistently and loudly. And I love what the elderly lady did next. Very calmly, she gets out of the car, she walks back to the pickup truck and motions for the man to lower his window. And once he does, she politely then says to him, I'll make a deal with you. If you'll go start my car for me, I'll sit back here and honk your horn for you. <laughs> <laughs> in that moment, she had risen to the occasion of the challenge that was in front of her, dealing with someone who was impatient and did not understand the predicament she was in. But in that same manner, Jesus does in this moment. When we read this passage in Mark's gospel, it simply tells us that one of the scribes asked him a question. But when you read it in Luke's gospel, you find that there is an intent behind it. Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel gives us a little bit different angle and gives us the indication that they were testing Jesus when they asked him this question. You see, this is one of those questions that could have been tricky. It could have been one of those questions that no matter how you answer this question, it could cause you difficulty in the surroundings you were in. The passage in saying that it was testing him was not necessarily indicating that they were trying to trick him, but it was saying that this scribe of the law, that it, when it refers to this man, one of their primary duties was to transcribe, hence the terminology, transcribe the law. 
And in doing that, the lawyers or the scribes would often debate with others about different laws and breaking them down until they had come up with an enormous amount of laws of do's and don'ts. In fact, it was over 600 that they had derived from the original law. So when you think about the original law, you may be thinking the Ten Commandments. But out of the Ten Commandments and the Old Testament covenants, they had come up with, I think it was 612, don't quote me on that, but I believe that's right, 612 different laws. Um, I think around 150 of them were do's that you are supposed to do. The majority of them were don'ts. You don't do this. And it was one of those things like dealing with the IRS. You know, if you do it one way, no, you've done it wrong. You're supposed to do it this way. You know, it can be very tricky. And, and it's amazing, right? When you look at the, the handbook, I don't understand why tax law has to be so complicated and has to be listed in a book thicker than I would ever want to read. You know, I, I just don't understand why it has to be that difficult. But it is. It depends on your circumstance. And if you're spending money on this, this counts as a deduction. And if you're spending money on that, it, it does it. And, and, and it gets very, very minute. And that's kind of what they had done to the law. And a lot of people had learned loopholes through those laws. And so when this man perceived that Jesus knew what he was talking about, he then asked him a question, kind of testing him to see how deep his knowledge was, how authoritative he would be in it. And Christ's response was very good. He responds to him about the two greatest commandments. He says to him that the first commandment is that you love the Lord your God and thou shalt love him with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment, he says. And then in verse 31, he says, and the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Now, this story goes on to indicate to us that Jesus perceives that the man understands the law, obviously being a scribe, but I'm not sure if he's fully getting the impact of it. And so the best way that I could illustrate to you is this. When he says that thou art to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, your might, all of us would agree and understand and, and identify with that, would we not? But sometimes we don't pick up the second part of that, or we feel like the first is a mandate and the second may be an optional thing. But the way he listed, he says the first commandment is to love the Lord. But the second is like, indicating this, that they are the flip side of the same coin. So let me give this illustration. Jack, would you mind if, if, if I use you for an illustration this morning? Yeah. When, I, when he saw green, he said, okay. <laughs> so, so if I were to give you that, what would you say I gave you? I gave you a $20 bill, right? You would not say that I gave you the heads side of a $20 bill, would you? Why? Because if you turned it over and the back was blank, would the front be worth anything? So it's, it's two sides of the same bill. You don't say that I gave you the front side of a $20 bill, nor do you say I gave you the back side of a $20 bill, depending on which side I handed it to you on, right? You would simply say, you gave me a $20 bill, right? All right, thank you. You want to hold on to that? <laughs> the point in the illustration that I'm making is what Jesus says is this command is very similar. That if you take one, you take the other. And if you don't have the other, then the one is counterfeit. It's not real. It's not full. It's not sufficient. And so if you say that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your might, your soul, your strength, and you do not love your neighbor, he says, then the first one is not real. 
Because when he says that the second is like, what he is identifying is that it's the, the, the second side of the same bill. It's that I am taking this command. And when I take this command, if I love the Lord my God that way, then I will, in fact, automatically love those who are around me. Loving our neighbor is an outgrowth of a right relationship with God. Of all of the Christian virtues listed in Scripture and taught by Christ, love is considered the most important. Man, uh, 1 Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 13, verse 13 says, three things will last forever. What are they? Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of those three, now of all the things that he could have said will last forever, what he's saying is that they'll last past this material earth. That last pass, the cars that I have, the homes that I have, the clothes that I wear, they will last forever. There are some things that will rot and decay, but there are three things that will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And he says of those things, the greatest is love. Our love for God, our love for our fellow man. Mark chapter 12, verse 31 says, when he ends this section here in verse 31, he says, there is no greater commandment than these. Of all of the laws and of all the commandments, of all the Ten Commandments, there is none that are greater than these. In fact, Scripture indicates, and Jesus indicated, that all of the laws hang on those two concepts. Right? Let me see if I can give you an illustration. If I love God with all of my heart and I love my neighbor as myself, will I transgress by lying? No. Because if I'm lying, I'm lying to my brother. And if I love him as myself, I wouldn't want to be lied to, so I'm not going to lie to them. Nor am I going to lie to, trans lie to transgress the law of God because I love him. And so if I love God and I love my neighbor, I'm not going to lie. If I love God with all my heart and I love my neighbor as myself, am I going to steal from my neighbor? No. What God is saying is, what Christ was saying is that all of the laws hinge on the concept of these two things. And if you don't have a full concept and acceptance of those two laws, you don't understand any of the rest of the laws. It doesn't matter how minute you get it. It doesn't matter how many laws that you make up. It doesn't matter if you come up with 600 or 6,000. If you can't understand those two, all of the rest are null and void. These two are really important for us to get. If we try to divide these two principles, we nullify the truth of the first. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 says in the King James, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who lo loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. It doesn't mean that we always agree. It doesn't mean that we always uh, approve, but it means that we love our neighbor. It means that we love those that are around us. And sometimes it's important that in that process we are able to identify what it means to love. In Luke's gospel, he goes on to illustrate this by the parable or the story of the Good Samaritan. You know the story of the Good Samaritan, right? In Luke's gospel, he tells that story of one who was beat up and left on the side of the road, and a, a, a Levite priest came by after one came by and robbed him of what he had. A Levite priest came by and walked on the other side, and then a Samaritan came by who was not supposed to care for Jews, who was not supposed to interact with Jews. And the Samaritan, the, the, the power of that story is that the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along. They did not really interact that well together. And the Samaritan cared more for him than the Levite priest. And in doing that, what Jesus illustrates is that he, he makes a division between religion and having a full relationship with God. He says, just because you have a position and a title that sounds religious, or just because you go through the motions and go to a church that looks religious, if you do not have the love of God at work in your life, 
you're not being a neighbor. And his final question to him was what? When he gets down to the end of it, he says, now, which one of these do you think was his neighbor? And the response that he gets is the one who showed him mercy. He understood that that was the one who was being a neighbor. Because in, in, in Luke's telling of it, the scribe comes with a question before Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And, and he says, after he receives the instruction to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and strength, and to love your neighbors yourself, the response is, then, then who is my neighbor? And so Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan to identify who our neighbor would be. Asking people to personally identify the, with the story of the Good Samaritan is a little bit like asking children of a picnic time softball team what position they would like to play or of a football team, tag football team in the yard, what position they want to play. Rarely do children on their own come up to the conclusion that they want to be the center or they want to be the catcher. Most of them want to be the pitcher if you're playing baseball or they want to be the quarterback if you're playing football. And asking people to identify themselves with the story of the Good Samaritan, rarely do people say, you know what, when I hear that story, I identify with a robber. You know, no, nobody jumps up and says, you know what, I go to church every Sunday, I try to live a religious life, I just don't have time and patience for people who don't. I identify with a Levite priest who walked over on it. No, nobody says, everyone wants to identify as the Good Samaritan, right? And so it's not good enough just to read that story and ask us which one we identify with because we have to examine ourselves. Few of us will voluntarily choose to identify with the priest or the Levite or the helpless wounded man or the robbers. No, we often identify with the Good Samaritan. So the first thing that I think is important in this when I ask the question of who is my mission is I think it's vitally important that we answer the question of who my neighbor is. And as I already told you in the version that Luke tells, he adds that parable of the Good Samaritan. And when Jesus finishes the parable, he asks that question of which one of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the thieves? The lawyers responded, the one who showed mercy. You know, it's easy in that to, to pick up the idea that we want to limit who our neighbor is. And that perhaps may have been what the scribe was trying to do when he said, well, who is my neighbor? Because most of the time we want to know what our responsibility is. But I'm not sure that that's the right question. I don't think the right question is to ask, who is my neighbor I think maybe the right question to ask, which Jesus kind of turns it on this angle, is to ask this question, who should I be a neighbor to? And when we ask that, we view it a little bit differently because the terminology neighbor comes from a concept, an idea of those who are near, not only those who live near, but it is those or one who is near could be our workplace, it could be the place that we live, it could be the place that we frequent, it could be the encounters that we come into at a restaurant. The idea of it is, and what Jesus indicates, is we are the ones who determine who our neighbors are by who we come in contact with. And when we do, it's the ones that we show mercy to that become our neighbors. It's the ones that we love. Not only living beside, but anyone within our reach or the reach of our love and of God's love. Jesus deals with the consequences of no mercy in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 through 35. He says, then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Should I forgive him seven times? 
And you know the response. Jesus says, no, but I say to you 70 times 7. I, I don't think that Jesus was necessarily trying to lay a number on it. I think what Jesus was trying to indicate to him was that it is important that you love other people. And not only do you love them, but you not only love the people that you identify with or get along well with, but you love even your enemies. You see, in this parable, Jesus talks about the first man that had an unpayable debt in Matthew chapter 18. And under Roman, Roman law, he should have been sold into slavery. You see, the way that worked in that time was that if you could not pay your debts, that you could be sold until you could work your debts off. And according to Roman law, that's what should have happened. But the king did a remarkable thing. The king, seeing the situation, forgave him of his debt and let him go free and said, you owe nothing. That very same man, then forgiven, turned to someone who owed him, and he did not forgive him. When the roles were reversed, we often see change, or we often change our stance on that concept of love, mercy, and long-suffering. And what happened was that this man, when he was forgiven, he then turned to someone that owed him and was unwilling to forgive. You see, the idea of us showing mercy has consequences because when the king hears about that, what happens is the, the debt that was forgiven him, he ends up having to pay a price for. So what God the Father tells us is that we have been forgiven our sins we have been forgiven our debts and we are to in turn then turn and love and encourage and help and show mercy to those that are around us and so if we're looking to identify who our neighbor is we have to first look at ourselves and say those that we come in contact with and we are able to show mercy to become our neighbor when he talks about this action of love to those that are around us and who is my mission? Agape is defined by Christ's action, not by a dictionary. The defining mark of what agape love was, was defined on who Christ is and what God the Father defined it as out of the Old Testament and in Leviticus chapter 19. Christ's teaching in the New Testament in Aramaic and the writers of the New Testament in Greek Give us a concept, an idea of what agape is. Now, there is a difference between agapeo and agape. They are simply the same term, but agape is the noun version of love, and agapeo is the verb version of love. And so when he says that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves, love goes beyond a feeling. Love moves to action. What I'm saying by that is this. Has someone ever told you, I love you, but they did not show it with their actions? Love is something that if it is real and genuine and true, it shows it through its actions. And what he's saying is that if we love our neighbor as ourself, it should indicate it through the way that we act and interact. In a book by Dave Ferguson called Discover Your Mission Now, he recounts a reading of a doctoral thesis, which was entitled, Blessers versus Converters. The research looked at two teams of short-term missionaries in a foreign land with distinctly different strategies in their mission work. The team, referred to as the Blessers, went with the intention of simply blessing people in practical ways. The Converters went with the sole intention of converting people to salvation. Here's the summary of what they discovered. The blessers had a greater impact than the converters, with 50 times as many conversions as the converters. You get that? Those that went to love on people and to bless people ended up having a 50 times greater response in their efforts to convert the lost. Let's bless those who are in a mess. What if God meant that we're to love our actual neighbors? 
But what if he meant that we're to love our co-workers and our extended family, simply those that we come in contact with on a regular basis? So here are a couple of quiet, practical questions that follow suit out of that. How can I get better at what Jesus says matters most? Because what Jesus says matters most And this is something, I don't know if it'll step on your toes, but this is something that steps on mine. Because what Jesus says that matters most is not that my sermon outline is formulated correctly. What Jesus says matters most is not that our worship and our music is the best in town. And what Jesus says matters most is not that we dress the perfect part when we come on Sunday. And what Jesus says that matters most is not that we have a nice building with good media and nice lighting. And what Jesus says matters most is not that I get my normal parking place. And what Jesus says that matters most is not that I have all of the details outlined and laid out perfectly and everything runs smoothly and I go home feeling like, man, I did well today. No, what Jesus says matters most is that I love the Lord my God with all my heart, my soul, my strength, my mind, and that I love my neighbor as myself. And if I don't do those things and I get everything else correct, I've missed the boat. And so he clearly tells us who our mission field is and he says that it is one of the most important things we can do. So how can I be better at what Jesus says matters most? And how can I be the best neighbor that I can be? Here's another question for you. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. This one hits me strongly. I believe that if I were to leave my work at hospice, I believe my coworkers would notice I really do. I believe that those that I am able to provide ministry to would notice. But here's a question for you. I, I'm a solitary person. I know a few of my neighbors. I know just a little bit about them. My neighbor to the right moved in about a year ago. He's, him and his wife are retired. Currently, he's dealing with brain cancer. I talk to him occasionally. He's able to carry on. You wouldn't know it if you just met him. I know my neighbors, the family across the street. I'll talk to them every once in a while when we meet at the mailbox. But to be honest with you, I don't know anything about them. I know where their son works. The only reason I know that is because I see his uniform if he's coming or going from work. But here's a question that I have to ask myself because I'm the type that I'm content when I get home to get in my yard and get in my home and just enjoy the solitude. But when I ask these questions of how can I be better at what Jesus says matters most and how can I be the best neighbor that I can be, here's a big one. If we moved out of the neighborhood that we lived in, who would notice or even care? And if they wouldn't notice, if they don't care, are we fulfilling the commission to love our neighbor as ourself? James chapter 2, verse 14 through 16 says, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say that you have faith, but you don't show it with your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or a sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, Goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? That's, that's not Raymond, that's not a quote from Raymond, that's straight out of James chapter 2. And in that he's saying 
there's a disconnect if we say that we love God and we say we love our neighbor, but we do nothing to encourage them, to bless them, to love them, or maybe to invite them to an opportunity to receive the message of Christ if they do not know him. It is one thing to love, but it's another entirely to love them as yourself. Does that make sense? You see, <laughs> this is probably not going to sound very good, but it's simply the truth. There are a lot of people that I love, but loving them like myself, that's a whole different ballgame. I want you to hear what I'm saying. There are some people that are easy to love. There are other people that are easy to love at a distance. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Some of you have family, and you love them, but you just love them at a distance. And you can love them, but you'll love them one day a year when we get together on Thanksgiving or Christmas. Right? It's one thing to say that I love you. It's another thing to say that I love you like I love myself because I can tell you that I love Raymond enough. I want to make sure that Raymond is taken care of. And when Raymond gets hungry, I love Raymond enough to make sure Raymond finds some food somewhere. And if Raymond is hurting and in discomfort, I'm going to do something to make sure Raymond gets somewhere he can get comfortable. Right? Right? It's one thing to say that I love my neighbor. It's another thing to say that I love my neighbor like I love myself. And what Jesus said is that if we don't get these first two things right, we don't need to focus on the other things. We need to come back to these until we get them right. And that is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, our strength, our mind, and to love our neighbor like we love us. Miss Andrew would come. I want to ask you to stand with me this morning. So I want to ask you personally, and I don't want you to turn to anyone else or look to anyone else or ask anyone else. I just want to ask you, what does it mean to you to love your neighbor. Here is what I've come to realize in my life. My neighbor is my mission. And if I do all of the greatest exploits in the world, but I do not love my neighbor, I've misunderstood what his encouragement and command to me is to do. And if I love them, I need to show them with actions, not just tell them with words. And so if you're going to do that today, how might you do that the best of your ability? To your neighbor, your coworker, to those that are near you, those that you come in contact with. It may be simply someone you meet on the road. That was the illustration that he gave in the parable. It wasn't someone he worked with. It wasn't someone he saw all the time. It was simply someone that this Samaritan walked by one time and saw in need, and he blessed him and showed him love. So my question to you might be, how might you show the love of Christ to your neighbor today? It may be by leaving an extra tip if you go out to eat today and a note to say, God bless you, God loves you, and so do I. It may be by baking some bread or a pie or some cookies and taking it to the person that lives beside you or across the street from you that you know might be going through a difficult time and just saying to them, God loves you, and so do I. It may be forgiving the person that you work with who's done you wrong and undercut you. Praying for them that God bless them in spite of what you have been through. To you in your personal life, my question and my challenge to you this week is, 
what does loving your neighbor look like to you? And I want to challenge you to implement that some way this week with someone that you come in contact with. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your blessing, your grace, your mercy. We thank you for the message that you have given to us today and the words that we find in your scripture. I pray that you will help us as your people to love you. And when we do, to understand that we should love our neighbor as ourself. That they are two sides of the same coin. They go hand in hand. And when we do, may we do it with the grace and compassion and anointing of your spirit. And God will give you name, praise, and glory for everything you do in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, if you would like prayer, maybe you would like to.